In 1979, two young Australians shared a small house in Sydney while they struggled to make it as actors. One of them, Mel Gibson, became an overnight success. The other, Geoffrey Rush, honed his craft on stage and emerged as Australia's top theatrical actor. With the film Shine, Rush has made it in America too. Starring as David Helfgott, a real-life Australian pianist who triumphs over his painful past, Rush has won Best Actor awards from the New York and Los Angeles Film Critics, a Golden Glove nomination, and is almost certain to be nominated for an Oscar. I'm pleased to have him on this program. Welcome. Thank you. Tell me, I've seen the film and liked it immensely. Um, tell me about the film for the benefit of the audience who may not yet have seen it and you want them to see it. Well, it's inspired by uh, the true life story of this prodigiously gifted classical pianist, child prodigy, called David Helfgott, who grew up in Perth, um, the geography of which I think is fascinating because Perth is on the extreme west coast of Australia. Um, I think it is fa fairly well known as being one of the most isolated cities in the world because you travel west across the Indian Ocean, Africa is next. You go north, India, Singapore. It's a four-hour plane ride across the Nullarbor Plain, which is predominantly a treeless desert, to land in Adelaide. And you're still only halfway across the continent. And then there's Sydney and Melbourne and Brisbane on the east coast. It's very removed. Somehow out of this small town came this uh, extraordinarily gifted child pianist. And people like Isaac Stern and Daniel Barenboim were passing through Perth in the 50s and 60s and seeing David play in these local piano competitions and uh, really encouraged the boy's father to send him to America to study or possibly to Britain. The father um, was a survivor of the Holocaust, uh, a refugee Pole living in suburban Perth, which would have been at the time in the 50s a fairly unusual thing. He would have been very much culturally in the minority. Uh, through a fairly misguided but overpowering and destructive love, he wants to hold his family together and denies the boy the possibility of reaching adulthood normally. I mean, he just contains him, engenders in him a great love of music and the piano, but accidentally suffocates the child's creative abilities. David eventually breaks away from the family, gets to study at the Royal College of Music, and undergoes a pretty devastating uh, mental and physical breakdown, and then spends from his early 20s until his mid-30s uh, in an institution in Perth. But the story do doesn't plummet totally into tragedy because he re-emerges one rainy night and stumbles into this wine bar in Perth and uh, gets to the keyboard and plays the most phenomenally speedy, virtuosic version of The Flight of the Bumblebee and the patrons in the restaurant jaws just drop. And uh, not long after that he meets this extraordinary woman, 12 years his senior, who becomes like a kind of Diaghilev figure to his Nijinsky and she takes him back on the road to concert performing and they marry and have this extraordinary redemptive love relationship um, in, you know, in opposition to the father's destructive love in the earlier part of his life. David Helfgott is alive and well, as you say, in Australia and performing. He is indeed. I mean, this, these events occurred in the mid-1980s yeah. and uh, over the last 10 years, he has been playing quite successfully in various pockets in Denmark. I mean, he was given the great honor to play Liszt's piano, which is in some museum, I think, in Germany. That's a very rarely bestowed honor. Did, did you talk to him during the preparation for this? Did you? To a degree. Um, because of my stage background, I mean, the, the actual text, the script, and in this case, Jan Sardi's screenplay was a very vivid read and when I first read it I'd not heard of David at that point. He was only known in various musical circles in Australia. I then had the great good fortune of seeing him play quite by accident some 
two or three days after I'd read the script, I was going through the newspaper and saw David Health got in recital, and I thought, this is you know, too good to be true. So I did go along as a fly on the wall and uh, was able to observe this phenomenal person. If this The first clip we have shows him it's later in the film, but it'll give you a sense of him. This is when um, Lynn Redgrave plays Gillian, who was an astrologer who follows him to his room after a performance and helps him compose a letter mm -hmm. to his former music teacher. Here's that clip. Uh, dear Mr. Oh, such a long time ago. Such a long time. Huh? It has been it such has. a long right, time. Right, such a long time. <laughs> and I. Oh, and I. And I hope. Hope. Hope, Gillian. How does that sound? Is that right? <laughs> Sounds pretty good to me. Uh, and I hope you remember me uh, and the Rack Three. <laughs> wow. Uh, what happened to him when it comes to the acting of it? Uh, the Rock Manonoff Three. It's that difficult a piece. My musical friends and musical yeah. advisors on the film, um, to give to give me a theatrical equivalent, exactly. they said it's right. you know it, it's the King Lear of piano concertos. It's uh, I can't quote you the exact figures on this, but somebody uh, and this will date it to probably being a statement ba made in the 30s or the 40s by an Englishman, but he was likening to depress a piano key is like shifting X number of ounces of coal because coal was the source of heat and that yeah. was his yeah. equation. Yeah. And he worked out by the number of notes that are in the Rachmaninoff third piano concerto, the physical effort required to play all of that in 45 minutes is something like shoveling 10 tons of coal. I mean, it's an absolute marathon, not just in the kind of stamina required, but the sort of mental discipline, I think, to hold such a kind of powerful piece together because it, it soars through some you know, very, very strong emotional kind of states. And to pull it off, you know, like to actually render it not just as a technical exercise, I think is, uh, it's regarded as a bit of an Everest. Now, how did, because I've heard great discussions he was schizophrenic and that this language is reflective in some schizophrenics, this language yeah. thing, as you show, it starts tumbling out and disjointed and... And at the same time, if other people have said to me, no, 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 this is not the mark of a schizophrenic, this was simply a nervous breakdown. Yeah, it's, I got the same response. I mean, I've had psychiatric advice, I've had opinion makers and all sorts of people feeding me very conflicting reports. Um, some form of psychotic disorder, a very complex disorder. Um, I, as an actor, I was more inspi inspired and, and, and drew a lot of value from David's self-description. He simply refers to it as the period when he was damaged. He said, that's when I was damaged, I was damaged, wasn't I? Or that was the period when I went into the fog. And what do they think, though, that happened to him because he climbed this mountain? I mean, that's what do they think? It's the combination of his father and the pressure his father put on him, mm. both encourage him to greatness and pulling him back. That plus this huge piece that he feels compelled yeah. to prove something to somebody. It's elements of all of those things. I mean, it's, it's very hard to dissect a person's life and say what ingredients have gone into shaping and he's your no destiny. Help in it. I would say Having spoken to my piano tutor, he gave me some very vivid descriptions of the lonely life, the marathon existence that people who are aiming for, a, let's say, a, 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 a successful international piano career, they spend that very, very crucial time of their adolescence locked away in a room, coming to terms with these monumental works that require a great deal of discipline and practice and focus. They have no social life. It's a sort of it's a strange but wonderful obsession. Uh, he sort of said, you know, at least if you're a string player, a violinist, you get to meet three other friends by, you know, playing in a quartet. Yeah. And I think because David obviously had a, a very fragile disposition as a child, this talk of it being possibly genetically based, I don't think people know. And David says one of his great catch cries about life in general is, it, it's a mystery, it's a mystery. And sometimes I think, well, go with the mystery he has. Yeah. He's come through, he's got beyond it. He's kind of devised his own self-therapy by 
positive thinking, getting back to knowing what he does well, having the love of this woman. This is a clip in which you mentioned he enters the bar and begins to perform, which is his first step back after being a terrainy night. I think the film opens this way, as I remember. Mm -hmm. uh, roll tape, and then we'll talk about uh, Jeffrey Rush, the actor whose life has been changed by this film. Roll tape. When did this performance first become to your attention, the fact that you would play this role? I met with Scott, the director, in 1992, and um, thankfully, he was very, as a filmmaker, he was very familiar with my work in the theatre, because he lives in Adelaide, and I'd worked in Adelaide uh, quite a lot during the 1980s. I was a member of a company there for a couple of years, and had gone back almost annually to do something with that company. And the casting director, who was from Sydney, was very familiar with a lot of my Sydney stuff. Uh, and they offered me the role. I just went in and they said, it's yours. It's yours. You're the only choice. Yeah. I, so my guess is they had, had considered no one else. They, it, that's what they, they told me. They had focused on you early. Yeah. I mean, they were in a dilemma because when the screenplay first became a reality, they were taking it around to people and attempting to raise the finance and everyone was saying this is a wonderful script and an extraordinary story about the most amazing man but who on earth are you going to get to play this part because he's got to be a great pianist he's got to be able to act he's got extraordinary emotional range i mean um the act, well the acting and the emotional range i'm, I'm sure they, they had no problem about that playing the piano might did you play did how much piano did you know i played till i was 15. And when I look back at the, you know, the patterns that form in retrospect in your life, um, I stopped it then, totally, and was never a classical pianist. I mean, I was thumping out pretty bad stride-based versions of Alley Cat and the theme from Mondo Carne, you know, yeah. that sort of stuff. Uh, it's when I took up being in uh, the drama club at, at high school and started, uh, you know, performing. Not ever dreaming yeah, that I would. Yeah ever become a professional actor. How did you get, I mean, how, how did you prepare for this? Uh, I sat at the keyboard and my hands were like frozen because I had no, there was no race memory in there of any familiarity. And the sort of stuff that David plays is, as you heard in that piece, I mean, that is Rachmaninoff's transcription of the Rimsky-Korsakoff piece, which I think he wrote for trumpet. Yeah. And it's a real, show-off piece. I mean, that's showing how flashy you can be in a, a bit of a lollipop, you know what I mean, a novelty for the yeah. crowd. Yeah. So um, I just nailed down to Scott, the director, and got my piano tutor in and said to Scott, look, we've got to almost treat this like a special effects sequence. And, and you've got to give me a rough idea of may, maybe how you're going to storyboard this, because I've been through the pieces and I can give you bar 44 to 56 with everything in shot and my fingers will be, you know, moving over the keys pretty accurately with David Helfgott's recorded music, providing the sound, of course. But these next three pages, forget it. You've got to be David Helfgott to even keep up. Yeah, right. And that's when you've got to cut away to the bar and have people going, he's very good, isn't he? Yeah, you know? right, right. But this is the scene where David literally gets back on the horse. And my instincts as an actor told me, um, don't let the audience sniff that there's anything fake or artificial going on here. Because Scott said, we would always cover, well, they were going to use David Helfgott's real hands because we have similar kind of finger structures and things. As a filmmaker, he wanted to be assured that he could have the coverage so when he got into the editing room, he could yeah. put it all together. But on the day of filming, um, I'd worked hard for a couple of months to get my bits down and I got just the reaction I wanted because all the people on the crew sort of went, <laughs> and I thought that's that's what the scene's about. Getting back on so the horse. So he didn't. So he didn't cover. Yeah, yeah he didn't. Getting back on the horse. He didn't need to cover. It. They, they just came back from the dailies absolutely over the moon. And Helfgott's reaction to the story, to the piece, to the film, today. 
I've not spoken to him personally because he's now off doing uh, a, f a very successful. Enjoying his new fame. Well, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, that's always been there, but suddenly yeah. he's um, he's just relishing exponentially it. Exponentially like more people know about him today than they. He's did. capturing the lost years. You know, yeah. thirteen years out of a uh, a brilliant concert pianist's life is is pretty major. Yeah, and he is rediscovering the audience and himself as a performer. How has it changed your life? Apart from meeting these two extraordinary people who, you know, I've never met anyone like David Helfgott and Gillian as a partnership. I mean, I hold them up there in terms of the right people in the right place at the right time by fate coinciding and becoming one new thing, you know. Um, Career-wise, I mean, you know, when I play in the theatre in Australia, I do eight shows a week in a theatre that might hold 300 people. So that's what, you know, 2,400 people you do off season for six weeks, that's 12,000 people. You suddenly do a film, and um, I'm standing on the street in New York last night, uh, an absolute stranger in this town, and somewhere I'm having a cigarette outside. So outside walk, of the theatre or outside? Out, outside a restaurant. Yeah. I'm t you know, my second night in New York. Someone walks past and goes, I love your film, and just keeps walking on. I'm going, this is, it's a totally out-of-body experience, you know. It's great to meet you. I love the film, as you know, and to meet you makes it even more interesting. Uh, it's an extraordinary accomplishment by all concerned, from the uh, creators and the directors in the film, and good luck with um, all those things, and uh, please come back anytime. Thanks, Charlie, Thank very, very much indeed. Jeffrey Rush, the film is Shine, uh, David Hellcott's story. It is an extraordinary story, a film about family and a film about music and a film about uh, what else? The whole world, the I whole mean. World. <laughs> and, and life going down and life coming back, all of that. We'll be right back. Stay with us.